Well, despite what it might seem like in our modern world that we live in, truth matters. And if you've noticed over the past while, um, especially in the past couple years, it's been kind of highlighted by the fact that it's hard to find truth. It's hard to sort through the information that is always coming at us. We live in an era where we have more information accessible to every living human being than ever before. And in fact, it's not even close. With the advent of the internet and phones that are in every person's hand or pocket, we have access to information that has never been like that in the rest of the history of the world. In the old days, if you, when I was a little kid growing up, when you'd have to do a report in school, you'd go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, if your school was lucky enough to have one. And it'd be like 30 volumes of these little books. Those are paper, kids. And in it, you'd have to go alphabetically and research Komodo dragon, you know, in the Ks or whatever. And whatever the Encyclopedia Britannica had for you, that was about all the information that you'd be able to get on something off the wall like that, right? But we don't live in a world like that anymore. Right now, I can pull up pictures of Komodo dragons for you. I don't know, this Komodo dragon thing just came to me, all right? This is in my notes. I can pull, pull up pictures of them, uh, the, their dietary needs, where you can get a hold of one if you want to try to raise a nine-foot lizard in your house. You know, all these things that we have access to instantly that we've never had before. But with that advent of endless information, what we've also found is there's lots of endless bad information, false information, things that aren't true, that act like they're true. And so we've come to the spot where even though we have access to all this info, we can't figure out what's true and what's not true. And we're constantly having to sort things out and try to read through what people are saying to figure out where truth is. But credibility matters. It really does matter in life. We have to know what's accurate, what's false information, what's fake news. Where did that statistic come from? Who was it that said that? This stuff matters, okay? Because here's the thing. It's hard to make good decisions with bad information. It just is. That's, that's the way it is, right? If you don't get all of the information, if some information is withheld from you, you may, it may sway the way you make a choice or what you're going to, to do. And sometimes bad information is put out there on purpose by people. There are people out there that just want to confuse other people. And it's their mission in life to mess stuff up. <laughs> and, and that's what they do. Sometimes bad information spreads all through the world just because it's repeated so many times, or in the case of social media, because it's liked so many times or reposted so many times. And pretty soon, absolute false information pops up as truth, as fact, and so many people have heard it, and so many people have bought it, that it's almost as if it was true. And sometimes, unfortunately, we take in bad information just because we're too lazy to find the truth or good information, or maybe we just don't think it matters. I mean, how many of you guys that are parents or were raised by parents where you've heard this statement, you know, when, when a couple of the kids are arguing or fighting or whatever, it's like, I don't care who started it. <laughs> Anybody? I'm the only one who uses that? All right, we've got a few, right? You get to a certain place where you're like, I don't need the information. I don't need the backstory. All I know is the two of you are fighting, you don't need to be. <laughs> I don't need it, right? Sometimes we ignore that information, and sometimes it's, it's okay. But don't you want to make good decisions in your life about things that matter? And don't you know that you really do need credible information most of the time to make those good decisions? Well, that's what we're going to look at here today. If we want to make the best decisions and choices possible, we really need to have truth. That's why truth matters. And that's what Peter is going to emphasize to us today. He, he's going to point us to the source of truth 
So, as he's going to describe it, so we might have light to guide us through the darkness that we find in life. Because there's a lot of times in life where we need truth to make decisions, and it's cloudy, and it's dark, and it's hard to figure out. And he's going to tell us, hey, we're going to need that. And, and, but it, it's important kind of that we have the context to what he wrote here. Because if, if I just started out with the verses that we're going to look at here today, you'd kind of be like, what? I don't get it. I don't really understand what he's saying. So I'm trying to give you a little background, fill you in a little bit. Now, if you're here with us last week, and I know that not all of you were, um, one of the things that we've been talking about in 2 Peter is that Peter was writing this letter with death hanging over his head. We looked at those verses last week. It was very clear to Peter, not only was he in a Roman prison at this time when he's writing this, but not only that, he had some insight from God that, hey, Peter, it's almost done. This is almost the time. And history tells us that ultimately Peter would be beheaded, or I'm sorry, not beheaded. It was a a different apostle that was beheaded. He was crucified. uh, Tradition says upside down because he didn't want to be crucified like Jesus by the Romans in Rome. In, in a very short time after this letter, right in about the late 60s, okay? So he knew life was short, and, and he wanted to share, as we talked about, information that he thought was going to be important for all those believers that were going to be following after him. Now, we as Christians, and, and these Christians that Peter was li- writing to, knew a lot about Jesus already. They were believers already. We, we know as, as Christians, even non-Christians a lot of times, know the Christmas story, for instance. We know that Christians say Jesus was born as a human being, a simple human, to a couple poor parents in a remote part of the world. And that is how he was born, in a stable, right? But as his life would go on, it would be revealed that not only was he a simple human, but he was the glorious God. And that's what we talked about last week when Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration and he saw the glory of God. And Peter told us last week, he said, that glory of what I know about who Jesus is and what I've seen from Jesus shapes the way I live my life because I know of who he is and I know what eternity is all about. And the verses here that we're going to look at that are following that are, are, are ramping off of that. He says, God is glorious but also know that the reason, part of the reason that we knew he was glorious was that moment when God in the cloud came over and spoke and said, this is my son. And you remember the words that we saw last week that he also said? The father said, this is my son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Why would Jesus' words matter so much? Because He was the glorious God. And when Jesus spoke, it was God speaking. Two verses. Hebrews 1, 1 to 2, says this very thing. It says, long ago, here's the verse on screen for you. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. When Jesus spoke, it was God speaking. Jesus himself said that in John chapter 12, verse 49. He says, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. What did Jesus himself say? He says, listen, when I speak to you, the words that I'm saying, the things that I'm telling you are only the things that God the Father has told me to speak to you. It's important to understand. Jesus made some pretty audacious claims. Audacious is like a big fancy word for bold, fearless, audacious right some of the things that jesus said people would be like what when jesus said yeah i'm gonna die and three days later i'm gonna raise again that's audacious when jesus said i am speaking the words of god almighty that's audacious these were powerful powerful things that he was speaking he claimed to have truth 
direct, immovable truth from God himself. And guys, I don't know if you know this or not, but that's what Christians believe. This is what we believe. We believe that Jesus is God and that the words Jesus spoke were truth. And that should shape how we receive the word uh, from him. John, uh, another of the apostles that was there with Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he wrote his gospel, that's how he starts it out, focusing on the word. Here's what he says. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, but then he goes on and he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What's he referring to? Jesus. And we have seen his glory. This is going back to the transfiguration. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Here's what you have to understand. The disciples, the followers, Christians for centuries, the history of Christianity. Uh, Peter believed that Jesus was the source of truth. All right? You're getting that part? It's coming through? I hope so. Jesus was truth embodied, God incarnate. And that's why it was so important for the writers of the Gospels to record Jesus' words as accurately and completely as possible. He had the words of life. He is the word of life. Now, I understand that this whole idea might seem kind of strange to you. God speaking to people. It feels very, I don't know, mystical, spiritual, kind of scary. Um, that's what we saw last week, right? God spoke, everybody fell on their faces. It was scary. But God has always spoken to people. Always. And if you think that all of a sudden, one day God decided, okay, I'm done. I'm not talking to anybody anymore. That doesn't seem to make sense with the rest of God's nature and all the history uh, that we have. All right, you go back all the way to Genesis, and God was speaking to Adam and Eve. And from that point forward, he was speaking to his people. God chose Abraham and said, I, you and your descendants are going to be the group of people that I'm going to speak my plan for redemption through. And throughout history, God spoke to people through messengers. Sometimes they were angels, like supernatural beings. Other times, it was a group of people called prophets. Okay, and prophet, a prophet is simply a messenger from God. The role of the prophet is only to directly speak what God says to them. All right? And prophets would hear that word and deliver it to the people. And before Jesus arrived, God, God's people collected the words that were spoken by the prophets into a written form as their sacred book. It's the Old Testament that we have today. And I, I go through all of this because in the passage today that we look at, Peter wants to reinforce the fact that those words, these writings, this Bible that we have is God's word to us. And not just a sacred book, it's a source of truth. And remember at the beginning when you agreed with me, you need truth to make good decisions? <laughs> you see where this is going, right? Okay. Let's read the passage. We finally got there. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 says this, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't nullify what the prophets had said from the Old Testament. God spoke to the prophets, the prophets spoke it to the people, the people collected all the things that the prophets had said. And then what would happen is those people would go back and study those things, saying, okay, this is God's word to us, came through the prophets, we're going to learn these things, we're going to study these things, we're going to memorize these things, we want to know what it is that God has spoken to his people. All right? They gathered it together. Every week in synagogue, the Jews would get together and they would read uh, from the, those, those, those words that had been spoken. And Jesus, when he shows up, he says, I'm not wiping that out. I'm not here to say, get rid of all those other things, because what God spoke is still what God is speaking. And the things that he spoke then are still the th same things that he's speaking now. The New Testament tells us that God does not change. 
He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So those things, they still count. They're still valid. In fact, Jesus came and said and did the opposite of that, of, of wiping it out. He says in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. That's the, the, the entire sacrificial system that was given to Moses. Or the prophets. All these prophets that we've been talking about. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. You see, the, the Old Testament, the Bible, the, the, the words of God that these people were studying for all these years, they were all setting it, things in place to point people to the fact that they need a Messiah, that they would need someone to come and fulfill everything that they couldn't pull off. They found they could not be righteous under the law. They could not do all that the prophets had spoken them to do. And instead of just hopelessness, they had the right attitude, which was, well, we just hope that someone will come along and do it. They were all pointing to Jesus. They set the stage for his arrival. And they created in, in his people a longing and an anticipation for a savior. And they were and they are the genuine words of God. So what is, what is Peter telling us here? Remember, the verses before this is he said, we saw God in glory. We saw the Father tell uh, us to listen to Jesus because he has my words. But what we want you to know is that that then confirms the prophetic word. That's pointing back to what, what, what had come before. Now, you might look at verse 20 and, and try to say, well, what does that even mean? Knowing that, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So, are you saying that nobody's allowed to interpret this? So, it's interesting because that verse is difficult to interpret because of the word interpretation. What it actually means um, is just unloosing or a release of something. So what he says is, look, if it's scripture, it's not just because somebody came up with a great idea. It's not because somebody had this really clever thought that came to them and they said, oh, I'll just write this down. That sounds good. That's like scripture. And so I'll just tell everybody my great idea and everybody will be like, oh, it's so cool. We're going to call this the Bible. That's not what he's saying. It, that's, if you look at verse 21, it explains it. He says, because no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You see, Scripture didn't originate with human authors. God used humans to write this stuff down. But it, 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 it was initiated by God. God spoke through these people. When you ask the question, well, who said that? God did. Therefore, we should pay attention to these words. God, the author of all things, has spoken to us. You already told me that you need truth to make good decisions. Well, guess who's the best source of truth? God. Truth has been given to us. So, some people ask this sometimes when they come to our church. And it, it's not solely our church. I'm not pretending that we're the only church that teaches the Bible. But some people ask, man, why do you emphasize the Bible so much? It's like, you set aside a huge chunk of time to the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. I mean, come on, there's other stuff, right? <laughs> and just the Bible, why do we emphasize it so much? Why do we give it so much credence? Because we really do believe it's the Word of God. And we know that we need truth, and we need light in a dark world. And that this is a place for us to find that truth. That's why we emphasize it. If you go onto our website and you look at our values, uh, as a church, the first one that pops up, Bible-centered ministry. We want to be a church that keeps the Bible at the center of what we do. All right, I'm going to read it to you. It says, we desire to be diligent learners and teachers of the Word of God, which will inform all of our beliefs and practices. Biblical teaching is the catalyst for true transformation of heart, mind, and character. What we know is when we are flooding ourselves with the truth, as we'll see, it illuminates us and it changes us. That's why we emphasize it like we do. That's why we pay attention to it. That's why we read it and study it and meditate on it. All right? The way Paul described it as he was um, pastoring uh, one of his pastors that he raised up, Timothy, here's what he says in 2 Timothy 3.14. He says, but as for you, talking to Timothy, but we can take it in for ourselves, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood 
you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which, listen, are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man and woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Do you want to be complete, equipped for every good work? The person that knows truth? Yes, we all do. This is a way for that to happen. We need truth in a world where truth is hidden. And that's why God gave us his word. The world is dark, but his word is light. Think about that. Say it again. The world is dark, but his word is light. Psalm 119, 105 says that very thing. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's not just pretty poetry. What he's saying is this can guide you in the way that you live your life. And in a dark space, a little light goes a long way. I've told you this illustration before. Sorry if you've got to hear it again, but it still makes the point. And it came to my mind again as I was thinking about this. Um, a while back, my family and I were uh, vacationing in, in Kentucky. And we went into Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. All right, and Mammoth Cave got its name because it's really big. Really mammoth. Okay, hundreds of miles of these cave systems <clears throat> underground. And, and one of the things that they do on this tour of Mammoth Cave is they take you into this room that is far bigger than this. That's why we opened the side here today. To make the gym look big, well, this, there's a room in Mammoth Cave that's far, you can put multiples of these gyms within that room. Okay, so when I say it's a big room, it's a big room. And it, the ceilings are high, and the walls are far. And you get all together in there with the tour guide, and they bring you in, and they say, all right, everybody, we're going to let you see what dark really feels like. And they shut off the lights. And you're in this massive space, but you cannot see anything. Unless you're with a little kid who's got those light-up shoes and standing beside you. That happened to us. But you, you, it's pitch dark. There's nothing and then you know what he does? He lights one match. And this massive cavern, you, you're amazed at how much that one little match lights up the room. Now, you wouldn't want to go too far on that one little match because <laughs> it's still pretty dark and scary, even if you're not into scary and dark. But that single point of light provides quite a bit. Now, that's good and all, and I would say that all of you have a little bit. You got at least a match worth of light, of truth, of the word in you. But guess what happens when you really want to see something well, and you want to be very precise? Have any of you ever had any operations or seen a, even a TV show where they're in surgery, and you've got these surgeons with the lights that, you know, flex and bend and move around? They are wanting to light up the area they've got to work on. Not just a little bit of light, not just a, yeah, put a candle over there, we'll be okay, I'll kind of wander my way through it. No, they're like, light this guy up, because I got to know what's going on here. This matters. This is, the, this is the concept, this is what he's talking about here. He's saying, yeah, you can have a little bit of light, a little bit of truth, and you might make some so-so decisions most of the time. But what happens if you're loaded with the light, and you see things clearly? As we said, when we have that accurate information, when we have that light, we have that truth, it guides us, it directs us. The more the word we have, the brighter the light. And so listen, guys, for some of you, you may feel like or have been feeling like lately you've been kind of stumbling around life. And I think all of us go through some of those seasons. Some of you, it may be more than a feeling. You might know at this point. You've had enough people tell you, you got to get your stuff together because you're falling around, falling all over the place, right? Maybe the issue isn't the consequences of other people, and it's not your, your life issues. Maybe it's the fact that you just need more light to help you see where you need to go. And Peter says here, he says, one day 
The morning star is going to rise. That's a reference to God as the morning star, the the source of all light. It's going to rise. Full day will dawn, right? This is pointing to heaven, as we've talked about before, how God himself will light up heaven. One day that's going to happen, and you're going to see things, everything perfectly clearly. But until then, you guys, we need as much light as we can get. If you want to live life the way God has, has set it up that you could live. And I don't want us to be ignorant of that. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians are deceived in this life by darkness simply because they don't even know the light that's been given to them. In 2 Corinthians 11, 12 to 15, it it says this. Paul writing this, he says, And what I am doing I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. They're basically people bringing a different message. All right? And he says, and no wonder, for even Satan himself disguises as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. The question is, how do you know the difference? If he says right there, look, you're going to have false light that even pops up. I'm telling you, pursue the light, pursue the light, pursue the light. Well, great. What happens when Satan throws something at you that looks kind of lightish? And he's disguised in that way. How do you know the difference? How do you discern the two? It's by knowing God's word. It's by knowing the truth so well that you can discern the truth from the lie. Now listen, I, I, before we finish here today, I, wanna, I do want to address a common misunderstanding. Because here's what I don't want you to hear today. I don't want you to think that I'm just saying the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, you need the Bible, the Bible matters, go for it. Listen, the Bible isn't just information. I'm not telling you you just need to be a scholar of the Bible and you need to pull all that in. Yes, it's a book, but the Bible's different than any other book. Listen to how it describes itself in Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Does any other book do that? No, it doesn't. This is a spiritual tool that's been given to us by God. And it's alive and can do things in us that we can't do on our own. Yes, it gives us knowledge. Yes, it gives us information and insight. Yes, it is the source of truth. But because it's the living word of God, it does things that none others can. And God's word has power. And with a word, God spoke the earth into existence. You go back into Genesis and you look at that. Um, no matter what you're, where you fall on how creation unpacked itself, one of the, the things that you see all the way through it is that God speaks and it was so. God speaks and it was so. And whatever mechanisms he used, God spoke it and it happened. And when Jesus spoke, we saw the same thing happen. When Jesus spoke to the little girl who had died in Mark chapter 5, what did he say? Rise to this dead person. And what happened? She rose. We don't worship the Bible. That's important to understand. Yes, we emphasize the Bible. We teach the Bible. We study the Bible. We think about the Bible. We don't worship the Bible. In fact, there will be no need for the Bible when we get to heaven. You ever thought about that before? It's done already. But there's a greater need for the Bible in this life than most of us even realize. So here's how we finish here today. My question is this. If this is a powerful word of God, if this is the source of truth, if this is a a source of transformation and healing, of understanding, of discernment, the real question comes in, obviously, is that powerful word at work in your life? Are you spending time in it so that it can illuminate your soul and do what it's meant to do? Are you pouring light into yourself on a regular basis? You know, um, in the old days, when we used to use cash for 
cash money to buy things. You know, and people would go to banks and talk to bank tellers and things like that that had cash. Some of you remember that? Um, you know, one of the ways that they used to train the, the, the people that would handle money, you know what they do? They, they, don't, uh, they don't try to uh, uh, get them accustomed to counterfeit bills. They don't tell, you know, call them all together and say, guess what? All right, this is what we're seeing. These organized crime syndicates are building all these particular printers that are making these bills that look this way, and we want you to watch out for this. And, no, that's not what they do. What they do is they, or did, is they would have them spend lots and lots and lots of time with the real thing. They said, don't worry about the counterfeits. You just worry about the real thing. You handle it. You feel it. You smell it. You taste. I don't know. <laughs> um, but you get where you know money. You know what it feels like. You know what it looks like. You understand this is what a bill is really like. So that when something that isn't like that comes across your plate, you're like, oh, wait a minute. That doesn't feel right. That doesn't look right. Something feels funny about this. That's how they would tell the difference. This is what God calls us to do. He says, listen, I've already given you the real thing. You've got the truth. It's in front of you. You shouldn't make those mistakes as a Christian when it's right there telling you this is how to do it. You shouldn't sit there in a puddle of emotion saying, I don't know what to do or where to go or how to make my next step. When God says, hey, I'm talking, can you hear me? I got some things to say to you. Listen up. He'll lead us. He'll direct us. That's how we learn to discern it, by spending the time with it. So the challenge then for us today, how much attention are you actually paying to the written word of God? If you're doing it, keep it up. If not, maybe that's exactly the thing that God's calling you to in your life. And, and, and two statements on that as, and, as we finish. If you've never read the Bible, because let's face it, guys, I know how some of you made it through high school, and when you'd get a book like this, you'd be like, uh-uh, I'm not reading that one. Like, that's way too thick, way too heavy. Uh, Dave was complaining today that my Bible's not big enough, okay? But I, I'm trying to make it thinner so it doesn't look so, quite so uh, overwhelming for people, right? For you to say, man, there's like a thousand pages in that thing. How am I going to get through it? Look, if you've never read this thing before, just start small. Uh, you don't have to come back next week having read it cover to cover. If you do that, great, go for it. But start small. Start somewhere. The Gospels are a good place. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Look into those. Start reading those a little bit. Read a psalm. Psalms are, are short. It's a book of songs is what it is. It's poetry. All right? And you might not be into poetry, but try one. Read a psalm. Read a little bit of the gospel. Start small, but just start. Okay? That's one way to, to get it. And um, begin working your way through it that way. If you have read the Bible, because here's the other problem that happens. I know many of you have been walking with the Lord for a long, long time. And many of you have read the Bible cover to cover already at your life, in, through your life. And your issue is, you're kind of like, eh, I already read that. I don't want to go back to it again. Okay, my encouragement to you on that is not to start small, but to go slow. All right, go slow. Begin rereading those passages that you know really well. But take your time with them. It, it, Any time that you approach this, this book, this spiritual book, start off with prayer and say, Lord, speak to me through your word. If this word's really alive, impact me by it. Speak something to me out of it. And begin to study it slowly and meditate on it. And let the word of God do its work of shaping you and transforming you. And no matter where we find ourselves today, May God lead us all into his truth and his path and bring light into our lives. Amen? Pray with me. God, thank you for this day. And Lord, I do thank you for your word. And, and Lord, I, I thank you that uh, you've spoken these things to us through Peter. I know it's sometimes hard to hear when you come to church and your pastor tells you to read the Bible. But Lord, we, we are aware today of the truth that's found in it. And God, I just pray that we would be people that know the truth, that can discern the truth. People that can understand what it is that you're calling us to and, and can hear your voice. And I know, God, that you speak in other ways. You don't only speak through your written word, but it is one of the primary ways that you have given us 
to hear your voice and to hear your truth. Make us people that know what it is that you are doing and what you have done. Help us have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness and a hunger for your word. May we be people that always want to hear your voice and follow it when we hear it. We pray these things in Jesus' name.